In this lecture, we're looking at the history of the Crusades, and we're going to do so in two parts. And this lecture is the first half of our exploration of the Christian pilgrimage holy war to Jerusalem and to the surrounding regions of the Middle East. And we do have to say a word before we begin about the ongoing legacy of the Crusades all the way down until today in the 21st century. There are a few periods of time that have this level of investment at the popular level in terms of a sort of cultural memory as to what did or did not happen in the Crusades. In particular, in a post-9-11 world, the Crusades are something that is discussed frequently, not only at the level of everyday people like you or me, but also at the level of politics. In 2001, for example, not long after the attacks of 9-11, President Clinton, speaking at Georgetown, placed the onus of the burden of why this happens, why this level of violence is acceptable in certain faiths, on what he called religious extremism. And he didn't stop only at those extremists within the religion of Islam. During his talk, he also mentioned that the religious extremism of the Middle Ages had caused the Crusades and all of the atrocities that followed. Other presidents have waged into this battle, not least George W. Bush, during the complexity of the Iraq War, was not averse to using language of crusade. And it drew criticism at the time, but he used language that at least echoed the ongoing popular understanding of what happened in the Middle Ages during these crusading years. More recently, President Obama, speaking at a prayer breakfast, urged those who identify as Christians to remain humble because we have read on our ledger as well, and we have atrocities in our background. And the amount of conversation that erupted, frankly, in social media and other places on the subject was really quite striking. And that's really only the tip of the iceberg. Just about anyone who is taught on the Crusades is usually not surprised when those who are attending a lecture, let's say, have a number of opinions as to just what went on back there. Usually laced within it, particularly amongst Protestants, is something of a latent anti-Catholic stance. The tendency is to blame the Pope or to blame certain doctrines within the medieval system of the church. Well, setting all that aside, we're not going to try to address or answer all of the popular misconceptions that are out there. We can, however, signal just a couple that are worth correcting at this point, just at the outset. First and foremost, the Pope did not call the crusade in an effort to conquer land. There was no effort in the West initially to move armies, vast numbers of troops, at enormous expense, in an effort to retake the Holy Land for the Western Church or for the papacy. When the Pope called for the crusade, he really only wanted an army of a few thousand to travel down there and to assist the Byzantine Empire in their ongoing war and struggle to define the borders of their lands over against the Seljuk Turks. So what's going on here is not a land grab or a money grab, it's not necessarily corrupt people initially saying that they are going to enact a war in an effort to steal money or land or any of these kinds of things per se. In fact, the initial pact, the initial crusader oath, required that whatever lands were conquered, if they had been formerly Byzantine lands, that they would be handed back to the Byzantine emperor immediately. Secondly, and most importantly, this is the one that comes up more often than not, the crusades were not the first sally of the war or the struggle between the Middle East and the Western world. Too often what I hear is that there was a peaceable Islam off there in the margins of Asia Minor and on into the Iranian plateau, and that bloodthirsty Christians went and attacked and stirred up the hornet's nest, and that therefore all the hostilities between those who identify as Islam from these regions can trace the origin of their fight all the way back to this point. Actually, the fight or the struggle between those who identified as Islam, the caliphate, and etc., had been going on for some time. What happens with the Crusades, rather, is not so much the first attack or the first fight or war between those who are from Islam and those who are from the Christian world, but rather the latest in a series of ongoing struggles that would define a millennia, frankly. All the way from the beginning, 
There was an expansion of Islam, sometimes by the sword, sometimes not. But in terms of its conquering of Christian lands, very often it was by the sword. And as we've seen, when we looked at Al-Andalus, Spain, the armies of Islam had marched all the way up into various parts of southern France. Also, if we keep a global perspective of Christianity, the West is not the entirety of the church. There is a Byzantine church all the way out there on the fringe, at least in terms of the fringe from the vantage of Europe. And the Byzantine world had, over the centuries, contracted and expanded its borders in a series of ongoing skirmishes between themselves and the caliphates that carried on the legacy of the Islamic faith. So in many ways, what we need to do is not so much ignore the Crusades or explain them personally as if they were a justifiable good thing, but rather we need to actually take an historic position, which is that for centuries, from the beginning, and frankly, all the way down until as late as the 16th century, European forces and Byzantine forces and forces of Islam would clash with each other almost without ceasing. So the Crusades were an enormously important part of this, but it was not the only part of the story. Okay, so what is a crusade? Well, a crusade is some weird Frankenstein amalgam of a pilgrimage, a holy war, and penance. And what's going on here is as the Middle Ages wear on, a couple of things sort of sync up together that provokes within the First Crusade in particular a series of convictions and principles that were to define the crusading era. In other words, when the Pope calls for the crusade in the first case, They really had no idea what that meant. But rather, as the First Crusade achieves some level of success, and as it self-identifies as a crusade, all of the crusading spirit thereafter is rather a de facto definition of what they are doing, rather than some great leap intellectually that caused them to go and do it. Well, the doctrines in play, the theological issues in play, are that as the crusade launched, as the popular preachers went around and tried to stoke up people to go on crusade, there emerged a doctrine of a plenary indulgence. And a plenary indulgence is a full pardoning of all the penance one owes for the sake of minor or even, in some cases, major sins. Now, we're going to talk about the medieval understanding of salvation in a later lecture, so we're not going to go into all this right now. But needless to say, This is the first instance of this thing called a plenary indulgence, and it was intoxicating to those who heard about it. Here was the opportunity to bypass purgatory and go straight to heaven, foregoing all the penance that was required as a result of one's sin. Next is this idea of pilgrimage. Now, pilgrimage is quite old. It's quite ancient. Almost from the beginning, Christians would go on these pilgrimages. They'd go on these treks to various locations usually associated with the life of Christ. These were considered to be, for lack of a better word, good works, good penitential action by the Christian, going to the places of the Holy Land in particular and experiencing personally the origins of the faith. The last piece, and the one that is harder to define, is this concept of holy war. As we looked at in our lecture on Augustine, and as we've noticed in our lecture on knights and chivalry, Europe really had a problem on its hands when it came to violence and war. Those who were trained to fight often found themselves being asked or being cajoled not to fight. They felt a bit pinned in. The church wanted to put an end to violence within the context of Europe itself. Also, Augustine, in his doctrine of the just war, had laid out categories that would allow a Christian to determine or allow a Christian empire to determine at what point violence was possible. Now, that is in contrast to the ancient church, which took a almost entirely pacifistic stance. But as the years wore on after Augustine's death, the belief in a holy war was now pretty much ironclad. Now, what is the context of the actual calling of the First Crusade? Well, out in the east, in Asia Minor, as the caliphates had risen and fallen, and as there was division within the House of Islam between Sunni and Shiite Muslims, there was often a lack of cohesion when it came to their attempt to gain lands that were owned predominantly by the Byzantine world. At one point, they expanded quite rapidly all the way up to the borders of Constantinople itself. But by the beginning of the 11th century, in particular by, say, roughly 1125, 
the Byzantine Empire had reconquered and retaken the vast majority of its previously owned lands. That is, of course, until the rise of the Seljuk Turks. Now, the Turks were a nomadic folk who had come down into the Arabic lands and over the course of a number of years had actually converted and become Muslim themselves. Well, eventually they rose to power, and within the Turkish regimes, there arose the Seljuk Turks, a particularly effective group at conquering lands and cities and distributing their empire across a vast array of land. The other context within Christianity is that not long before the calling of the First Crusade, East and West had finally had its schism. Now, we're going to look at the Eastern-Western schism in a later lecture, but we at least need to be aware of it. Just a matter of decades, really about a generation before the First Crusade launches, the Byzantine world and the Catholic world had sundered. And that rupturing between the Orthodox faith and the Catholic faith is still in effect today. They are still separated. Well, at the calling of the First Crusade, this was a relatively new thing. And so at least in the collective memory of those who were still alive, there was a natural tendency to believe that there ought to be some cohesion in the Christian empire. All the way back until Constantine, who had founded the city of Constantinople, the emperor had considered himself, frankly, to be the head of both East and West. Now, as we've seen, that is beginning to fracture. The West really simply just stops taking notice of the Eastern world. And with the result of the schism between the two churches, the division between East and West was growing more fixed. Well, as the Seljuk Turks take more and more land, eventually, the emperor of the Byzantine world, Alexius I, reaches out for assistance. He sends ambassadors and representatives out to the West to meet with Pope Urban II with a request that they send troops to help defend the borders of the Byzantine world from this new onslaught of the armies of the Seljuk Turks. Well, when the Pope, when Urban hears this, and he hears of the plight out in the East, he decides to take action. And of course, all of the stories we have of the Council of Claremont, which is where the First Crusade is called, are all really written down after the fact, so it's a bit hard to distinguish myth from fact here. But what we do know is that on November 27, 1095, Urban II mounted the pulpit at a council that had representatives there of both the church and the state meeting together for its own business. Urban issued a sermon in which he laid out the plight of those suffering in the Holy Land. He describes the Islamic Seljuk Turk armies as being bloodthirsty savages. And he says that our Christian brethren out in Asia Minor need our help and our support. He calls on them to mount an army and to enact holy war and go and free these lands. So that is the call of the First Crusade, November 27th. What happens after that, though, is, again, the Pope really believed that because it was a rescue attempt, that it was a support army, that really only a few thousand might go, and that he could incentivize this with a number of different ways, and that he could empower preachers and one particular bishop to really stoke up this desire. Frankly, he didn't believe anyone was really going to go, not many at least, not without sufficient encouragement. What happened, though, is lay preachers, those going about Europe trying to stoke up people to come to the Holy Land, to go on crusade, actually had an enormous effect. In particular, the preaching of a plenary indulgence, the ability to move beyond purgatory fully, initially after death, and to enter into heaven perfectly, really served almost as a manufactured assurance of faith. Now, it wasn't promulgated as such, but at the lay level, the lay preachers running around really induced a number of people to believe that if they want salvation for their sins, and who has more sins in this day and age than knights, well, they can now apply their trade, they can go to war, it will now be a holy war, they will not have to make restitution or justification for it, the Pope himself has called for it, and more importantly, they will get a plenary indulgence as well. Well, as a result, something in the neighborhood of 100,000 people mounted up and launched the First Crusade. In fact, so excited were some that there was actually launched a non-military crusade initially. And this was a band of crusaders, of lay folk, frankly, untrained people without really much in terms of arms or weaponry at all, certainly not any training. And this popular group launches in April of 1096, which is important because the crusading army had not agreed 
to head off and to land in the Byzantine world until later that fall. Well, off marched all this troop of popular peasants and the sort of lay folk, overly zealous of the desire for crusade, and they had marched their way down to the areas of Hungary. And this group, this popular group, was an enormous catastrophe. The vast majority of them did this, not because they were crazy, per se, though that's debatable, but rather there was something at work in their minds about this being perhaps the end times. There was a belief amongst some that they would liberate the Holy Land, that there would be a Christian king in the Middle East just prior to the coming of Christ. There was also a belief that vast numbers of people around the world would convert at one last swoop before the coming of Antichrist. And these folks do seem to believe that they are enacting some part of the end times, which in part explains their fervor and the rather silly idea that they would march off by themselves early for the crusade. I mean, who arrives early for a crusade, right? Particularly not with the army with you. (laughs) Well, later that year in 1096, the actual armies began to launch and they arrived in the area of the Bosporus there to help Alexius I. Well, immediately the problems began to emerge as to how the first crusade was going to go. For all of his gratitude that the crusading armies had arrived, Alexius was more concerned that he recover these lands and the monies that were owed to him. He continues to fret and enforce a really overly zealous oath that all the crusaders were to take, which is that any lands taken were to be handed over immediately. And by and large, the crusaders do. There is one who doesn't later, but it's a bit too complex to go into here. Well, the crusading armies launch with both Byzantine forces and the crusading armies from the west. They head down to the city of Nicaea, which they take in a matter of months. Now, taking a city in this day and age is usually not as it's depicted in the movies. Despite what Hollywood has told us, virtually no one ever launched themselves at high walls with people with stones and sticks and arrows and all kinds of other things up on top. They knew better. Kill all of your troops through some crazy volley of propelling their lives against the walls. It's not going to happen. It is a recipe for disaster. Instead, usually this was a siege warfare. You would come, you would attack, you would surround a city, and you would try to starve them out. Well, Nicaea fell pretty quickly. And the crusading army heads down, and they arrive at the city of Antioch, which is right there on the curve just before you head south to Jerusalem. Well, Antioch was a different matter. It was a virtually impregnable city, very high walls, relatively strong fortifications within, and a significant amount of supplies within that would allow them to withstand a siege. Well, the siege dragged on for months. And the problem with the siege is you only have so many supplies yourself. You have to feed these armies. You have to supply them. You have to pay them on some level. And if all you're doing is sitting around waiting for the guys inside to get hungry enough to come out, well, you're in for a long haul. And the siege of Antioch is almost comic if it wasn't so tragic and so many lives were lost. The Christian armies surround it. The Byzantine and the Western rulers begin to get into a squabble. At some point, the Byzantine armies had withdrawn and gone back to Constantinople. And a number of the Western folks, getting tired of this, said, forget the plenary indulgence, I'll just do the penance. And they trekked back to Europe. Well, in the end, they heard that there was a relieving army, as it's called, from the Turks They were coming in order to break the siege and end the crusade. And if it weren't for the sake of deception, someone on the inside of the city agreeing to open the gates in the still of the night and let people in, then it might very well have carried on for some time. But what happens is, as the siege breaks, they find access to the city, they go in and they massacre anyone who's left in the city. Antioch is now depopulated with the exception, usually of women and children. Well, just as they went into the city, The relieving army arrived, and so the Christians, now on the inside, lock the gate, and now they're being besieged. I mean, this is almost Monty Python, sort of a round robin as to who's going to besiege whom. Well, all seems to be lost at this point for the crusading armies. However, their spirits were picked up because a man by the name of Peter Bartholomew, one of these more millenarian or apocalyptic folks who had come along for the crusade, who, he said, through an ecstatic vision, had been led to discover, buried beneath a church there in Antioch, a relic that is known today as the true lance, or the lance, the spear, that pierced Christ's side while he was on the cross. Now, by and large, those who were knights, those who were the nobility, 
thought Peter was crazy. Peter didn't think he was crazy, though, and the vast majority of the popular level folks thought he had actually discovered something that was a true relic of the faith. And through that, and frankly through sheer desperation, eventually the armies in the city of Antioch have to sally forth, and they do, and they manage to break the Turkish armies who then flee. So by this point, technically, if you go only by what Alexius I has called for, which is the relieving of the borders right up against Constantinople and the reconquering of Asia Minor for the Byzantine world. Well, technically, the Crusade's done now. And this is the problem, though. No one defined what their final goal was when the Crusade launched. Urban had mentioned, in particular, the city of Jerusalem in his sermon, though, of course, none of the Crusaders were technically there at the time. But Jerusalem was, for most of the Westerners, the ultimate prize. It was not the prize for the Byzantine world. The Byzantine Empire, and frankly Christendom as a whole, had not held Jerusalem for 400 years. It had been part of the Muslim Empire for all those centuries. But, stoked by this holy war, the Crusaders now believed that they could take Jerusalem. And they believed that they were called to do so. And so down they march, and in 1099, they assault Jerusalem and they take it. They enter the city, and they assault and murder some 3,000 folks within the city, and they take it for the sake of the Christian empire. Now again, this is not in their minds taking lands that were not theirs. They had enough of a memory of the ancient world to realize that by and large, a lot of these areas, while not wholesale Christian, had been under the protection of the Roman empire. And since they believed that the Byzantine world and the Christian Western empire were extensions of the Roman empire, They thought of these as their lands. They thought they were freeing these lands, not taking them by force. Now, I don't mention that to justify what they did, but rather to give you a sense of what they thought they were doing. Well, after the taking of Jerusalem, this is the end of the First Crusade, as we call it. And there are a number of crusades. Again, the crusading spirit, as it's called, carries on long after this. But this is the great first crusade, the very first one, the one that launched so much of the crusading spirit going forward. And a number of things emerged after the first crusade was finished. First and foremost, you have founded a couple of really unique groups that are the stuff of legend when it comes to Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code levels of conspiracy theories. You have the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller. Now, both of these groups emerge as a result of the crusading spirit. If they had been something of a holy war pilgrimage, what began to happen is as they held these territories and as they broke these lands up into three or four regional groups or regional kingdoms, there arose the need for protection of escorts of the ongoing crusading spirit to protect those who were coming down now, not in large numbers, but in sufficient numbers, and they needed protection from the Turkish bands and raiders and armies all along the areas that they had now reconquered. Well, the first to emerge are the Knights Templar, as they're called today, or the Order of the Temple. Now, the Templars get their name because as they were in the city of Jerusalem, they used as their headquarters a mosque that at the time was housed on the top of Temple Mount, which is today where the Dome of the Rock is. Well, the Templars used this as their base, and because they were there headquartered up on top of the Temple Mount, They became known as the Knights of the Temple. Another group, the Dots Hospitaller, were a group who were designed to protect those who were coming in to the Holy Lands for the sake of pilgrimage. By far the most successful and the most lucrative and the most influential group, though, were the Templars. Well, part of the reason why the Templars are so well known in terms of this urban legend about them being so mysterious and having such secret knowledge of things is a result of a couple things the most important of which are the fact that they are a funky group. They are monk warriors, some kind of ninja, sword-wearing, tonsured, crazy man. And there had been nothing like this. The idea of a monk, someone of a monastic order, who walks around armed to the teeth like Rambo, is just something they've never seen before in the Christian world. Also, they were far off, so they were not well known within Europe, at least by and large. And so just by the circumstances, they achieved this level of mysteriousness that other orders, because they were based out of Europe, did not have. 
The major factor, though, is the desire to support financially the Knights Templar and their work in the Holy Land led eventually to the Knights Templar gaining enormous wealth in land and other things within Europe itself. At times, people would die and leave estates or money to the Templars. Base churches would be built back in Europe in various cities. If you go to the city of Cambridge today, for example, there is something called the Round Church, a great example of ancient architecture there. Well, during these years in the Middle Ages, this was at times a Templar church. And so you combine the weirdness of the Templars with their money and their power, which was independent of the natural structures of allegiance to the feudal system and the fact that they're in the Holy Land, and you have a pretty ripe situation for a conspiracy theory, which is frankly why all the way down until today, the Templars have this kind of mysterious legend about them. And in a later lecture, we're actually going to see that it's actually the king of France who eventually exterminates them, only contributing to the legacy that they held some sort of secret knowledge or power that the kings of Europe were now trying to take. Beyond that, though, beyond the actual founding of these orders, you have the ongoing problem of the West, in particular, trying to maintain financially and in terms of personnel lands that they had now taken by force. It is an enormously expensive and time-consuming operation. And overwhelmingly, the populace, the people in these lands and these cities, were not Christian. Or if they were, they were not Western Christian. They were Byzantine. And so what's going to begin to happen is the Turkish armies will come back and reconquer some of these lands. And the crusading spirit has to be restoked and more crusades launched as a result. In other words, if the first crusade had actually followed Alexius' wills in the oath and simply handed these lands back and fled back to Europe to enjoy the libertine lifestyle of somebody with a plenary indulgence, well then, the ongoing crusader spirit might very well have been quenched. However, now and for centuries, the West will believe that these lands are now theirs, and they will exert enormous energy and time and money and resources to maintain them or to attempt, at times, to reconquer them if they lose them, only cementing and deepening the desire to go on crusade in Europe. Lastly, the legacy of this First Crusade is that the relationship between East and West, between the Byzantine world and the Catholic world, only grew weaker. The West viewed the Byzantine Empire as duplicitous, as promising to help and not helping, as being only concerned about money and then turning their back when times got tight. And so, any opportunity for collaboration and goodwill which might have restored East and West, or at least begun the process of the restoration, now only solidified the distinguishing between East and West. And, as we'll see in our next lecture, when we look at the ongoing evolution of the later Crusades, what begins to happen is eventually East and West become enemies. Mm -hmm.